another great episode of the Dre and Smiley, the Inner Circle Podcast. Dre, today we have Candace Williams, and I, I was all over her TikTok, Instagram. Her, her special sauce is when she talks to you on your TikTok, it seems like she's personally talking to you. I was okay. like, I felt like she was asking me questions, so let okay. me read her bio. Okay. Candace yeah. Williams is a certified life coach, on-camera host and speaker. Throughout her decade-long career as a coach and a creative professional, Candace has challenged clients and audiences to build lives of greater peace, purpose, and joy while embracing and sharing their unique stories. At the end of 2021, Candace embarked on a year of deep transformation that she dubbed the slow year. Mm. I, I, just listening to her, when you hear her talk about being slow, not being slow, just slowing your life down. I, I'm so yeah. eager to get into that. The slow year and now shares the stories, principles, and practices that underpin this life-changing year through her speaking and coaching programs. Candace currently hosts a travel show for Carnival Cruise Line, <clears throat> where she explores wow. local culture, cuisine, and experiences at various cruise destinations in the Caribbean Sea, a dream job that she believes manifest, manifested as a result of embracing slowness in her everyday life. Candace, wow. please tell me, how did you slow down? <laughs> and and, and what, pace, what, what pace were you operating before you decided to slow down? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that was that's a really good starter question. Firstly, thank you for having me. It's exciting. And I love like hearing my bio read. It feels like, oh, my goodness. Wow, I've done a lot. Um, it doesn't sound like I'm too slow. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, I, at one point in my life, I remember being up at four in the morning, like hustling to build a business, going to like a full-time day job, getting off, working until 11 PM at night. So like, you know, sleeping like five hours a night type thing. Um, and I just, I felt for a long time overwhelmed, disconnected from everything. And so I just recognized that I needed to have this season of slowness and it has kind of become this way of being, a state of being that like kind of starts within and just radiates outward. Um, but my life kind of changed pretty significantly as a result of it all. So I was listening to some of your recordings, your TikToks, and you said when you slow down, it's not really that you don't chase your dreams. You're not doing other things. You're just slowing down. So is it slowing your pace down so you can smell the flowers or you just, <laughs> how did you... Did someone tell you or did you read something or are you just like, you know what, there's only 24 hours in a day. I, I can't do it all. So let me just throw away some stuff so I can maximize my life minutes. Yeah. How did that, how did that start? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think in the beginning it was a recognition that I needed to just quit some things, you know, like I had too many things going on um, that, that I was trying too hard to be, have, create something because my worth was so much tied to my productivity. And so I think initially it was like a very um, intentional choice that in the upcoming year I, I decided to kind of close my doors to the to the business that I had at the time. Um, I decided I'm just going to go out and get a, a day job, which I know that not, not everyone can do, but I'm just going to – I needed to just remove some things quite literally out of my life and that I was going to do it for a, for a season, that I was going to kind of give up the idea of chasing my dreams for a minute, right, because I felt like I was chasing dreams that I wasn't even sure if they were mine anymore. Mm. Um mm -hmm. And that, that in all of that, I was just going to get back to some of the principles of my upbringing. You know, I was actually raised, my dad's uh, African-American. He, he grew up in Mississippi. They were like 19, born 1935 sharecroppers, knows how to work, you know, but actually raised me in Australia, in the countryside, in a very kind of slow lifestyle, very kind of spiritual principles of my upbringing. And when I came back to the U.S. or came to the U.S. and started this, got kind of, um, so embedded in this culture of hustle and this dominant, mm. this dominant culture that tells us that we have to hustle, 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 that our, our worth is tied to our productivity and that we have to make something of ourselves and be somebody and do something. Mm -hmm. I got so much caught up in that that I forgot what it means to like really truly live and like what we're doing it for to begin with, right? Mm. 
Um, and so it was kind of this, um, what I would say as started out as like a season of like, if I can just practically slow down, if I can just put some things in place so that I can practically slow down. Um, but what I ended up realizing was that slowness is actually available to me. I talk about kind of everyday slowness now, that slowness is kind of available to me if we recognize it and understand it as a state of being. It's this kind of way of just, you know, whether it's the, the, the deep breathing, the medita meditative aspects of life, connecting to our sensuality through the way that we eat and the way that we interact with our environments and how we choose to get from point A to point B. And um, and so I will say that that's what's become true for me. And I know you asked one other question that I, which was around how do we still get things done? You know, like how do we, and I think I like to think of this almost like as a river, you know, like I think about with, with, with hustle, it's kind of almost like we're swimming upstream a lot of the time, right? We're like, we're working really hard. We're pushing, we're striving. But what I found is that when I came into this place of stillness, and as place of slowness that started from within, inspiration started coming in, opportunities started arriving. My mind became clear and open and spacious in a way that I started to see solutions and possibilities. Mm. And so now when you enter the stream, you're kind of going with the flow, right? And mm. so you're being, you're kind of just, it, it's like the slowness kind of makes way for the flow. Mm -hmm. And so, and the momentum just builds and things and doors started opening for me. My life looks nothing like it did, uh, when I, when I decided to embark on this journey. I bet, I bet. So something that comes to mind as you share your story, Candace, is this. For me, I have a really hard problem sitting still. Hmm. Like, I feel like I'm always moving. If I'm sitting still, anxiety comes over me. There's something that yeah. needs to be done that's not getting done. Um, even when I'm on vacation, I, I like to tell a story when I was in South Africa on Tabletop Mountain. I was with a couple of friends and they're all enjoying the view and talking about how beautiful it was. And while I was sitting there, all I could think about is all the things that I need to get done. It is going through my list. I wasn't able to slow myself down. And that mm -hmm. is still the case today. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that um, whenever I'm not feeling well, if I have a cold or I'm sick, something, something that forces me to slow down. One of the things I notice is how seemingly everything appears to be clear. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I'm able to kind of like see outside the box, right? The problem is that once I feel better, I get right back on that wheel and the hamster wheel and start running again. For someone like me, mm -hmm. what's the best way to make, what's the catalyst using one of Smiley's phrases here? What's the catalyst to kind of help me make that pivot mm -hmm. to starting to slow down what would you suggest for someone uh, like myself well, first and foremost permission <laughs> like because it's quite interesting what you just said isn't it you said um when i'm sick i notice that my my to-do list kind of like evaporates mm -hmm. because you've kind of given yourself the permission to like in that moment to to maybe heal somewhat you know there is this reason why you've kind of given yourself permission this reason why i don't have to be concerned with all the things but in right. all of that also the racing thoughts leave your head the to-do mm -hmm. list becomes less significant mm -hmm. and then the minute you're better you start placing significance on the to-do list again mm -hmm. and the minute you you start you know telling yourself you have no more, you don't have that permission to rest anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think like a good starting point is just like, do you give yourself permission? Because I believe that um, slowness a lot of the times is um, being willing to, to, to slow down and create pockets for slowness in everyday life. It requires that you believe that everything is going to work out for you, that everything is going to get done in its timing, that nothing is burning, that, 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 uh, you know, that life will continue to unfold regardless of the, the effort and the thoughts that you put into it. The other thing that you speak about that's very clear is that I just feel empty. When I was sick, I kind of, my, my thoughts left me, the thoughts mm, kind of dissipated. Mm, and the mm. minute the thoughts start coming back in, the frantic energy starts arri arriving mm -hmm. back into you because the thoughts are the things that creates the reality. Um, you know, I, I love this. And I, and, and one of my, one of my most powerful stories in, um, experiences in kind of the last two years was um, I went to uh, Mexico 
um, in August during my slow year. And I went to a, uh, I just was kind of going at the time I thought I wanted to maybe start running some retreats, which I, I do still intend to do. And so I went to this venue, I wanted to check it out. And I decided to participate in this Temescal ceremony. Have you ever heard of a Temescal? No. Yeah. So it's like a, the indigenous peoples of Mexico practice it. It's like a traditional Mayan ceremony. And, you know, I grew up very Christian, very religious. And so initially I'm like, oh, I don't know, like, if, I don't know what's going on here. But I felt like I was called to this ceremony for a reason. And so I, I, I rock up. And at first I didn't understand what I was getting into. I was walking past and I saw this raging furnace and I saw um, a, a clay dome. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought, what are they doing there? And so they said, oh, kind of, it's this purification detoxification thing and I said okay I said okay great like that sounds good an evening of sauna steaming under the stars yeah I come back to participate in this ceremony and there's a shaman leading the ceremony he said to me um he said to all of us when we go into this ceremony into this sweat lodge it's going to be dark Mm -hmm. and it's going to be hot and -hmm. you're not going to be able to see anything and fear might arise Mm -hmm. and I, I just want you to acknowledge that the fear is not yours Long story short, guys, I ended up in a hot clay dome where you couldn't even stand up, sitting on the concrete with my legs crossed, not realizing what I was getting myself into, feeling claustrophobic and overwhelmed, and the shaman closes the door and I'm plunged into darkness. I can't even see my hand in front of my face and the heat is rising and my mind is racing. I have to get out of here. I can't breathe. I can't survive. And he says to me, and I I start trying to get to the door. And the shaman says to me, the fear is not yours, sister. I had no idea what he was talking about. But for a minute, Mm. the thoughts in my head stopped racing just for long enough for peace to enter. Mm. And I decided to stay terrified. But over the course of an hour in the hot and the pitch black with nowhere to go and nothing to do, I had to like choose to access the peace and calm within me. And the only Mm. way that I did that was by allowing the thoughts to leave my mind. Mm -hmm. And that's why I share that story because. That's a beautiful story. Were you alone in that dome or were there others? Were you talking? I was with with 20 other strangers who were hissing and who were breathing really heavy, which is almost more overwhelming because then you're stimulated. Oh my God. Imagine you're like right. you're in this dome and people are breathing really heavily, right. trying to catch their breath. They're hissing. At some point they started chanting. I was in sensory yeah. overload. Right. And I couldn't yeah. see anything. I didn't know anybody. And I couldn't even anchor to my hand in front of my face. Wow. 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 You know, what's interesting is uh, I, 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 I wasn't aware of what it was called, but a friend of mine went through a similar experience. I, I want to say it was with some Native, Native Americans, I believe. Mm-hmm. And it was exactly like, like you described, based on what he shared with me. And it sounded overwhelming at one sense, but also freeing at the same time. So tell me about how did you feel afterwards? What was the, was there a transformation? Absolutely. The, <laughs> this all went down for me about four months before I made the decision to then uh, let go of my 11 year marriage. Um, and I tell you what, what, what it was. It was this realization that fear was living in my body Mm -hmm. um, so deep in kind of like just in me Mm -hmm. that I was being unconsciously controlled by it. Mm. And when I felt so terrified that day and I couldn't see anything, I had nothing to anchor to, I realized that Mm. my only choice was to go within. It was like Mm. to find the peace and calm within because I can't rely on anybody I don't know anybody else in here I can't see myself I can't there's nothing physical there's no familiar faces there's nothing that I can anchor to I feel like I can't breathe and so after about 20 minutes into the experience I started to find this sense of peace within because all of the thoughts of of uh I can't breathe all the thoughts of fear started to Mm. leave me so Mm -hmm. by the time I left like an hour later I felt lighter. I felt like I had, I had this awakening and kind of this breakthrough into realizing that it doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what I'm faced with. It doesn't matter, um, you know, who's here for me or who's not here for me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be all right. Yeah. I'm going to be all right. And yeah. the only thing that I need to do is to clear my mind for long enough, give it the spaciousness, slow down for long enough for peace to enter. Mm. 
That was the biggest takeaway from that experience and has truly mm -hmm. been kind of like the underpinning of what slowing down really is about for me. Because when we give ourselves just enough space, if you can only give yourself five minutes or just a little break in the racing thoughts, in the, in the, in all that's going on in life, just little pockets of that throughout your day to mm -hmm. know that no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on around you, that you can access that peace within you, you start mm -hmm. to realize that um, your, your outside life starts to, re it starts to reflect your internal condition. Mm -hmm. would, would you, would you say that when you experience this uh, event in Mexico, that's where you were able to identify and recognize your rebellious spirit? Because in mm. one of your TikToks, you talk about in order. And I was thinking when Dre was saying how he can't slow down unless he's sick, I was like, that's because his spirit is rebellious. And if his spirit is, is rebelling against his calmness, saying, I have to do this, I have to do this, because if I'm not working, I'm wasting time. Yeah. So did that experience, did you come, did you have the slowness mentality before you went into that, that hour long experience? Or was that an outcome? of going through this experience? Um, it, 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 I had started my slow year prior to that, right? So mm -hmm. I had started in December of the year prior. So um, it's not that it was a result of it. It was It was just that um, I think what the Temezcal, what that ceremony just did for me was it, it made me realise that slowness is a state of being. Um, because I think mm -hmm. when I entered into the slow year, I felt like all these practical things needed to be moved around. And people would say to me, well, Candice, you can slow down because you, because you, you're in this predicament. Like mm -hmm. you can slow down because your life looks like this or whatever. Like I, you can slow down, but I can't slow down. And so people were giving me, oh, that's really nice. You can do that. And what that's that, that um, experience did for me. And I, which I only necessarily, I didn't realize necessarily at the time, this is kind of in retrospect, is that it really helped me to see like how much fear uh, was was um, cr um, keeping me stuck, right? Mm -hmm. And how much fear keeps other people stuck. It's interesting, however, that you talk about uh, Dre as um, his rebellious <laughs> spirit, and the reason <laughs> the reason why I say this because I ask because I'm gonna because I'm going to challenge you both. Okay, is it a rebellious spirit? Ooh. The reason why is um, rest is resistance. Have you ever heard this? Rest is resistance, especially no. as pe especially as black men, as people mm -hmm. of color. I think mm -hmm. about like my dad growing up as a share as a sharecropper in the nineteen thirties, mm -hmm. and the fact that black people for so long have been told that we have to work, work, work. Yeah. That mm -hmm. in this society, every mm -hmm. human, women, everybody has mm -hmm. been, we've been all conditioned to think that we have to work, work, work. We feel guilty mm -hmm. when we rest. We mm -hmm. only take rest when we're sick, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so then when I talk about it takes a rebellious spirit to slow down in a dominant culture that tells us that our only mm -hmm. way to uh, to assign our worth is by our productivity, mm -hmm. I would counter you, Smiley, and say that Dre is not being rebellious that's right <laughs> okay. <He's passive>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what, what would you say it is instead of rebellion it's just the just the uh, mindset you, of having to work just my upbringing the kind of the it's culture condition. i'm kind of stuck in conditioning it's conditioning it's funny you say, it's funny you say that because it resonates with me candace my mother um it, she works too hard. She's retired. She's in her 70s. Hardworking person, wonderful person. But it's interesting when I come over, I'm like, hey, let's go get some ice cream. I can't. I have to work. And, and this isn't work that she has to do. It's just something she's passionate about. But she, whenever I talk to her, it's more often than not, I have to work. I just finished working. I have to go to work. I have to. So that mindset, that that's... As you, as you, as, I, as you, I hear you describe it, it makes sense now because that's kind of the where she gets the value. That's kind of the conditioning she was brought up in. When, when you think about her generation, um, and it's 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 the polar opposite. And this is a question I'm going to ask you: is it's the polar opposite of, of today's generation, which is let me rest a little bit, work a little bit, rest some more, and if I feel like it, I might work some more. Mm -hmm. So why is there such a 
difference today with t- today's generation as it relates to work compared to your father, my mother, and how they perceive work? Mm. Well, I think that we're, we are breaking down a lot of societal structures and in so many different areas, right? I think that people are starting to see the holes and the, the, the issues in the generations before us, you know, and, okay. and how we kind of um, just every, look, we're, we're killing, we're, we're killing everything right now. We're killing our environment. You mm-hmm. know, our need to kind of produce, our need to dominate, our need to, mm-hmm. we, we've, we're operating in such a way that like our planet is dying. And I think that like this generation is starting to see it, started to experience it and realizing that there has to be kind of this new way of like relating to life. You know, people mm-hmm. are unhappy, you know, and, and, and how do we get back to happiness? How do we get back to a greater sense of like contentment with our lives? How do we stop like, you know, reversing and changing the way things are done so that we can start to heal our planet? I think that there is a lot more um, today we're, we're kind of breaking through a lot of this conditioning. Mm. I would, I would dare say, like, did you ask that question from a place of um, like, do you, when you think of that, do you perceive it as a positive or a negative thing? Well, let me think about that. So, well, just being my, my initial reaction is it as negative because because mm-hmm. I think of you know are they just they're just lazy they they just don't know how to work, mm-hmm. but the reality perhaps is that you know they have a better appreciation of the slowness that's needed, the slowness we all need to embrace. So perhaps yes. that's more of the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a friend who, um, she's very concerned with the planet. She's in the slow food movement. Um, and she's a plant-based chef. Um, they talk about regenerative uh, agriculture and, you know, um, different, another friend who's working in the Amazon to like, how do we kind of give to the local uh, communities and artisans that get money into the Amazon so that they can actually look after the Amazon in a way that like big companies aren't coming down, chopping down trees, killing the environment and all that type mm-hmm. of thing. But these are people that um, have embraced like that there is a better, more effective, more healing way of living, of being, mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. interacting, of us all kind of surviving. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that it's like whenever we have these judgments pop up in our head, of ourselves or of other people about what it means to be slow, we get to mm-hmm. challenge the judgments, right? Because, um, you know, I, I think that there is, there is something in this new generation that, you know, sometimes, you know, we m- might not always agree with some of these things keep falling out. Sorry. Um, That's okay. uh, um, but I think that there is kind of like a lot of beauty in recognizing that, Maybe the way of the past isn't isn't the way forward. And not if we want to keep sure. living. Sure, sure, makes one, sense. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say the one the one other thing is like my my friend who is the into regenerative uh, agriculture and slow food and all that. Her biggest fear, like she will cry about this, and I didn't even thought about this. She's got a small daughter, and she says by the time Frankie is, uh, you know, in her thirties, you know, or forties, the world will look different. And I want her and her grandkids to be able to like live a happy, healthy, but if the world continues the way it does, like it's going to burn, it's going to, you know, and she really thinks about these things that I think a lot of us that is in this, a lot of us today, we're consuming the way that we're like living our lives. We don't think about things like that. Anyway. No, no, that's uh, one thing I wanted to, um, when you started, you mentioned that you were from Australia and the culture was a little different because you're in a, a rural area. And then mm. you mentioned it to the US. I want to tie in your travel because you're on a travel and you're going to the Caribbean. So back in the day when I was able, I would go down to Jamaica, go down to Antigua and I would just chill because it's so, you can't get any more tranquilo than when you're in the Caribbean because everything is just calm. I want to. I want to. I want you to talk about the travel experiences that you have, and say, for example, from your vast experiences of traveling around the world, on a slowness meter to a fast meter. If we say Australia is number one for being really slow, just into themselves with lowest fear, and the U.S. is a racing ten and a half on a scale one to ten. 
where would you say the Caribbean is with your travels? And do you have these travel experiences with a slow theme or that's something totally different? Uh, that, that's been somewhat something somewhat different. I think that mm -hmm. there's probably something to say in, in all honesty for travelling and tourism as maybe not necessarily being all that slow at all. So I do want, mm -hmm. I, I do want to name and call myself out in all of that. Um, uh, I will say, I will say that um, I don't know that Austra Australia is more laid back, I think, as collective, especially compared to the US. Um, I also grew up extra slow just because of the way that my parents chose to raise us. Um, the Caribbean, oh my goodness. I mean, I, I dare say that the places that, that I've been are more laid back <laughs> um, uh, than, than Australia for sure. Um, island time is, is definitely a different type of phenomenon. For sure. Uh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you with the tie tie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I, I was looking at it on social media, and someone was saying something about when someone says, "I'll see you," uh, someone who lives in the islands, right? And they're coming to visit you. I'll see you in a little bit. A mm -hmm. little bit could be three hours. It could be twelve hours. It could be the next day. <laughs> so yeah. they're very, they're very kind of just laid back. Which is, uh, I mean, what's what's wrong with that? That's that's got to be great mm -hmm. in some sense. In some mm -hmm. sense, yeah, more structure. Mm -hmm. Um, go ahead, Smiley. So I was just going to say, so tell us about your travel experiences. So with this, uh, when you travel, you're a host there. You have your own channel on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Or, or yeah. What is that? Yeah. So it's actually a um, show that's produced for the actual cruise line. So it runs on the television screens on the cruise line itself. Oh, so, so okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the circuit. Yeah, yeah. So the purpose of the show is really to inspire the cruisers to get off the ship and into kind of the local economy and to engage with the locals and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, it's only on the ship. So if you like heading to Mexico, to Cozumel or, you know, so, free port. So interesting. We, we had a lady uh, chef. She was a cruise line chef, a Norwegian chef. And she said for 166 days she would make or what it was 300 days she was on the ship and she would make 180 different breakfast items every day. And it was so, do you live on the boat or you just produce stuff and it just played on the boat? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we've, we uh, fly, we fly into the actual port and film uh, uh, on, on land and then, and then, uh, yeah, it gets played on the ship itself. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then like my one friend, his mom, she, she takes 45 days she would spend, I think, out of 365 days, she spends more li more time on water than she is on land because she's in her 70s and she just cruises with her her bingo buddies and they just cruise all over. So they would oh know goodness. you as a celebrity because they're probably oh. watching you. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, that is yeah. so cool. Well, one last thing before we move into this, uh, to the final four, but I wanted to know, I, I mean, you said... Peace is internal and it shouldn't be controlled by external factors. I'm, I'm paraphrasing because that drilling above your head for months, did they finish or are you still getting drilled upon? <laughs> wait, wait, so, wait, wait, what's this? What's this? She, she, drilling above she, your head. She has this podcast or no, she has this TikTok where you get hmm. lately hear the pounding in this apartment or some building and she's like, can you find peace in within or is it controlled by external factors? Something like that she said. And you can tell, I don't know if your facial expression, but you can tell like she's annoyed with this banging. She's like months. done with it. <laughs> yeah, like I gotta, I gotta turn this into a positive. They just gave me some lemons. I gotta turn it into lemonades. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're lucky. It's a. It, we're lucky that it's not a weekday right now because otherwise you'd probably be hearing it. It's still going. <laughs> Don't know, don't know when it's going to end. But yeah, I was, I, I very much had this day where I was frustrated. I mean, you can hear it in the video. There's just like all this stuff going on around me, and I just realized, yeah, like peace is a state of being. It doesn't matter yeah. what's going on. So did it work? Did it, it work? Did. Did it, oh, it did. It did. Right. Oh, it did. Oh, it did. It did. It did. I've, well, I've, got, I've gotten very peaceful this year, I will say. <laughs> let me okay. tell you, I with my job, I travel a lot, and I'm on a plane. We were flying, I lived in Tampa, we were flying through the, what was it, the, the, some crazy weather. And I'm sitting there like this, and I'm straight sleeping. And <laughs> when we were about to land, the guy's like, how could you sleep through that? I was like, long as we land softly, I don't care what happens up there. As long as we land softly, <laughs> that's my only request for the podcast.
That's uh, hilarious. That's, that's hilarious. good. Wow. So, so as we begin to transition transition to the final four, um, one or two follow up questions. So, as a life coach, right? Based on what you shared, you have a strong knowledge and, and background and all this stuff to help kind of summarize, you know, what you do and the success, how successful it is for your clients. Can you share one success story that comes to mind in terms of someone that you've helped and it just, it was, they were able, able to do a 180 and their life just, you know, transformed after working with you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think about, um, a client, I think a lot of times clients, especially when they have children, mm. um, I think can be something that's really, um, in, you know, becomes another kind of dynamic that they have to look into. Mm -hmm. um, and just having kind of a client who came in as an entrepreneur, um, mm -hmm. as a mother, um, had multiple kind of things and, and, and things to juggle mm -hmm. and just realizing how uh, these little moments, these little pockets, the capacity to actually just be connected to food, be connected to the experience of the breath, being connected to the experience of movement, how these kind of little micro moments in the day um, mm -hmm. could allow her to feel more connected. I think that sometimes it's not necessarily a massive like overhaul or a huge transition or transformation in terms of what um, their external circumstances look like, but mm -hmm. how they're relating to what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis and the sense mm -hmm. of peace calm that almost I think a lot of the times feels very can feel can look intangible yeah. um, and just kind of transforming her health her hormone levels her, her the way her wow. you know all of that thing all of that stuff mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's great that's great so um okay let's let's do the here's the question that that's the transition question for the Hana four what's one thing that a lot of people don't know about you clients friends Ooh. family that you wish Ooh, they did. A lot of a thing that people don't know about me that I. You um, wish they did. Um, I'm not a boss babe. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, you know. You know. Tell, tell us more. Um, tell us more. You know. Oh uh, my goodness. You know. I think. <laughs> For a very long time, I kind of like felt very identified with this idea that I needed to be this badass mm. female boss babe that I needed yeah. to produce and create and that I wanted to dominate everybody yeah. and everything and men and all this. You're and, right, you're right, um, right. And I think that I, you know, I do things in my local community, storytelling events and different things. And um, mm -hmm. I just, I like live my life pretty surrendered. I feel mm. like things kind of happen. Um, that and the things that seem to happen the most effortlessly and easily, the things that I put the least amount of effort into. Mm. Um, I don't consider myself to like really be a boss babe, and I mm. and I don't necessarily desire to be perceived as such. Um, right. So right, I don't know. Right, that's right. the first thing. That's the first thing okay. that came to mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love yeah. it. Okay, that works. So cool. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I'm not a boss babe, and but when you said micro moments, I was thinking that's a cool T-shirt. Micro oh, moments. Yeah. <laughs> you, if you embrace yeah. the micro moments, they become bigger moments. So yes, yeah. So here's one. Here's one for you. The first of the final four. If you were to have dinner with anyone alive or dead, there's Oof. four of you at the table. You have one seat. The other three. Who would be at your dinner table and why? And where would you be in the Caribbean? <laughs> uh, um, probably somewhere in Mexico. Enjoy. Okay. I like Mexico. Okay, Eckhart. Mm -hmm. um would be one um cat toll um ooh. i've been reading a lot of osho lately um okay. and loving the work of osho i don't know if you're a familiar okay. spiritual teacher indian spiritual teacher from like the 90s 70s um died in the 90s um so i don't know if they are they meant to be living <laughs> No, no, it's really, dead, okay, or okay, okay. Dead, anyway, dead or alive. Dead or alive. Dead or alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. those two, I think spiritual teachers, like a lot of enlightenment there. Um, mm. And then um, I'm going to say something really standard and super basic, but like I think just Oprah. Oprah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean come on. Yeah, who doesn't want to sit it, with her? Right? I mean, who doesn't want to sit with Oprah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what's been your greatest success? Oh, my greatest success. 
I want to say it is, it has been developing um, a deeper sense of, sense of grounding in myself. I think mm. by really truly surrendering to a power greater than me mm. um, and understanding that I'm always kind of looked after, provided for, um, no matter what's kind of happening in and around me. I mm. just, I mean, that's probably been the biggest lesson of the last two years of my so many transitions that have happened. Um, and I was saying to somebody the other day, I just, it's interesting because the things that I put the most effort into, they mm. generate the least enjoyment and usually the mm. least money. The things mm. that I surrender to, like, you know, this year, my TV hosting, I have some booked modeling next week that I have to do for, for another brand, like all this stuff that just unfolds and kind of flows in when I just yeah. choose to surrender. So I think my greatest success is just like, the capacity to surrender over and over and yeah. over deeply every day. Wow. Uh, so you, bear, you, you buried the lead there. So you're, you're essentially a jack of all trades. You're a successful <laughs> life coach. <laughs> you're a successful, um, I want to say TV personality. Mm-hmm. You're a successful model. Is there, is there anything you don't? Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> She's not a boss babe. She's no, not, not a boss babe. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. I just, okay. You know, you know what I say? You know what I say? I say I host stuff. You know, I just host. say I, I host stuff. You know, I host. Okay. I host uh, group coaching programs, and I host okay. TV okay. shows, and I host storytelling. Okay. Like I host stuff. That's okay. what I do. That's, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> As as the third question on the final four, what is your superpower? Something that's uniquely you. Superman flies, Wonder Woman has an invisible lasso or plane, the Hulk is strong. What is something that's uniquely you that's your superpower? Mm. Um, I think I think bringing people together. Mm. Um, I think bringing people together and making them feel like they're a part of something bigger than they are. Mm, I've just mm-hmm. kind of passed the baton on a storytelling event that I hosted uh, locally. <laughs> I founded and hosted it locally in the city of Miami Beach for two years. Last year was mm. the two-year anniversary. And, um, and just kind of the community that was built there and just the capacity to be, even be able to pass the baton because we created something that people felt like they were a part of that was bigger than any one individual. So I think that that's it for me. No, I, I that resonates because I listened to quite a few of your TikToks, and I like the one where you said, "How do you, the words you use to describe your story matter?" Something mm-hmm. you've been affect mm-hmm. like that you said, and and I, I started I pondered that for a while. I was like, "Yeah, how do I describe myself?" Or how do the words you describe your experiences really is a reflection of the story you tell of yourself? So, mm-hmm. all right, that mm-hmm. makes sense. I see that as your superpower. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Just, you've, been, from, you've been stamped and approved by Smiley. Yeah, well, yeah, like, I, like I said, Dre, the one thing, if you watch her TikToks, it seems like she's talking directly like you. Like, only thing missing is Smiley, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, <laughs> it, it just seems so personable. So I felt like I yeah. watched it so many of them. I feel like we're yeah. friends. I'm like, <laughs> so, but. Awesome. It's good. It's good. Okay, the last question is, what would be the title of your biography? The slow year. There it uh-huh. is. It's there it is. Yeah, 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 it's it's a slow year. It's I a slow it. year. Yeah, it's, wow. it's absolutely. Okay. Well, Candice, this has been slowly wonderful. <laughs> it's just been <laughs> remarkable. I, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast and just sharing your experiences, your world, your 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 philosophy with us. It's just so uh it's exciting to hear the different ways that things have come together and manifested within you. So thank you for sharing that and your stories with our listeners. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, for being so smiley, both of you. <laughs> and, you know, and what a great conversation. And thank you for sharing some of, you know, some of yourselves with me as well. I greatly appreciate it. For sure. One of the goals of the podcast, I'll just say real quick is to have, everyday people that are living extraordinary lives you clearly mm-hmm. fit into that mold so again thanks for uh for being on the pod oh, my pleasure. oh All right. don't hang up